Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. And in this episode, we're going to be talking with Dan Hallett from Highview Financial. Uh, Dan is a name a lot of a lot of you will recognize. Uh, he's done all kinds of media appearances. He's well published himself. Uh, this episode is going to be good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, no accident and sickness credits in Alberta. It'll be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada. It'll be good for a credit from Advocus and IAS credit, and it will also be good for a compliance credit from IROC. I'm going to cover a fair bit of ground here. You'll see we have sort of a wandering conversation, which I quite enjoyed. I got to ask Dan a lot of uh, sort of uh, curiosity questions, and I learned a lot from this, and I'm uh, sure that you will as well. Uh, we're no longer doing colors for the uh, pre-interview session. We're now doing objects. So this... Uh, object, this lovely piece of art here. It uh, normally hangs on the wall just about here. You can see the empty nail. And this is by my friend Annika. Uh, we go and visit Annika normally every year. Um, her parents live in uh, sunny California, and it's always a good midwinter break. Annika and her sister Marin are always great hostesses. Um, obviously, we have not been there in a while now on account of the current situation. I'm hoping we can go back early in 2022. All right, let's uh, roll into the interview here. And following the interview, I have some comments about dealing with uh, compliance and how that works. I'm joined today by uh, Dan Hallett. Dan is uh, well known as the uh, principal at Highview Asset Management. Am I using that right, Dan? Can I yes. more accurate term there to use? Okay. No, that's perfect. Um, and Dan has a uh, very uh, a well-known media presence, both as a uh, contributor to other people's work and also you produce a, a fair bit of your own work, Dan. Is that about right? Yes. So it, I think a lot of folks listening to this are likely to uh, recognize Dan or Dan's name, some version of that. I'm lucky this is actually our first time really interacting other than an email. So real treat for me, Dan. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what Highview does and then maybe your role at Highview as well? Yeah, so Highview is, uh, was built around the concept of an outsourced chief investment officer. And the idea behind that was that we wanted to take the, a lot of the, the good practices that happen at a single traditional single family office and bring that to a commercial uh, operation. So one of the key things, for example, would be that independence. You know, we certainly could have could have uh, chosen to build, you know, higher equity managers and higher bond managers and all of that, um, but we thought, well, that still leaves a big onus on the client to try to find a way to judge our performance and and make a decision of whether or not to fire us. So we thought we really thought it best, especially the way the industry has grown and evolved. There's so many uh, excellent uh, uh, investment options. Um, maybe a little arrogant to think that we could build the best ourselves in house. So um, having uh, being one step removed and, and being able to source that the, those investment options at a, at a very attractive price um, allows us to have that independence and and be truly that CIO, which usually in an investment management firm of, of any size is overseeing all of the investment managers and making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And making the decisions, you know, based on uh, philosophy and process, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about philosophy then, investment philosophy? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of our key philosophies really is that um, you can't manage a particular outcome in terms of return. You can manage the risk side, um, and so what we do is really build. Uh, the investment portfolio side to align with the, the outcomes that clients need to achieve their goals. And so really the starting point for us is building that, that wealth plan, the financial plan, because that provides such important context and, and inputs, hard inputs, uh, to tell us how we should be building this portfolio for every client. I assume then your clients would not be chasing returns, like you would take deliberate measures to avoid return chasing? 
Uh, yes, because because everything is grounded in a a financial plan, out of which a specific target would uh, uh, you know would result. Uh, there, there, I think you can never get away from return chasing. To be honest, because people are people, regardless of whether they have fifty million or fifty thousand. Um, however, uh, uh, I think regardless again of of the of the range of net worth, and we do serve wealthy families and, and foundations. Um, but I think regardless, having that plan in place first uh, is just such uh, an important, important piece. And that's the piece that, that literally does come first uh, because it, it just makes the most sense to do it that way. So I assume then financial planning has been always part of Highview's approach to this. Like you've never been, let's say, only an asset manager, you've always said, we need that context in which to do the uh, investment side? Uh, yes. Uh, and my hesitation is we, we didn't have a dedicated wealth planning team at the beginning, but the idea of, of building a portfolio around specific goals, long and short term, medium term, uh, was, a, was a key philosophy from day one. So what does the uh, interaction look like between the, the planning team and the asset management team? Um, I don't know that there is, I, I think there is, um, I mean, listen, we're, we're, we're a firm of 15, so we always are talking to each other all the time because we're, we're a pretty <laughs> small team. Um, but in terms of the, the, the formal interaction, I mean, uh, I think we we you know when we're looking at the the um, the actual plan, it is pretty clear what needs to be done. So unless there are some complexities, uh, there isn't a lot of additional interaction at that point that that needs to happen. But the the functions are centralized. So um, there is a wealth planning team that 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 works on the wealth plans for all clients. Uh, I head up the the uh, the research and due diligence and analysis, which also uh, really is in charge of designing and building the portfolio. So, so a lot of that is uh, it is centralized, and it is to have the consistency. So we, you know, we we have a, a consistent set of processes and sort of building blocks. But the way we put that together for for each client is is where it's customized. Now, I'm curious then because you know using I big fan of this idea of using the financial plan as the core. And I think that's like with client focused reforms now that that's going to have to become, I think the standard and we'll see what actually happens here, but um, yeah. I don't want to be uh, naively optimistic, but sometimes that's the only thing that works for me. So, mm -hmm. um, but when you write a, or when you create a financial plan, then for let's focus on the family side for now. So you said your clients are, both wealthy families and then the foundations they would be connected to. Yeah. Are you writing, like, I assume you're dealing with a lot of multi-generational, like you got grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, kids, all as clients in some cases? Are, yeah, I mean, it, it varies. Sometimes it's just with the, the family and maybe they don't, just don't have a lot of other generations around them. But yeah, other times there are multiple generations involved for sure. Do you have sort of one financial plan for each generation or would you create, would you have everybody sit down and kind of work together to create one plan that looks at everybody's situation? Um, so my role is not primarily client facing. So we're, we're starting to get into details that I may not be as, uh, as front and Great. center with, but, um, but having seen how different generations have, have started to come in as clients, um, I, I think we, my, I think what we've done is we've done sort of the main plan for, you know, the original uh, client, um, which in itself may uh, and often does uh, at a certain level involve uh, the generation uh, below them. Uh, but then as that generation gets older and whether wealth is passed down, uh, you know, at that point, um, or they've maybe built some wealth of their own, they then come in as clients. And then uh, there is a certain point where we're building a, a plan specifically for them. So it just depends on, on every circumstance. But uh, in terms of the order, I think it, it, it just varies uh, uh, with every, every family. 
And then when you're dealing with their foundation, um, do you like would the risk look different there or does it essentially kind of mirror like the family came to you when they have this appetite for risk and and then you just translate that over to the foundation or because I can see an argument here for sort of a longer time horizon for foundations. Um, how do you balance that? Yeah, I think I think it just depends on what it is the family is hoping to achieve with with that foundation. I think sometimes it does uh, somewhat mirror what the family's goals are, uh, but other times it uh, it has a bit of a life of its own and and a purpose of its own. And so we we will plan accordingly and and design the portfolio accordingly. It's fair, right? I'm sure some families have this uh, intention of a foundation that will outlast them, create a legacy, and maybe some have more targeted objectives for their foundations with that. So given your role in on the research side then, um, I, I assume dealing on the foundation side that you must get involved in, uh, I don't know what the right term to use from your perspective is, but let's say impact or ESG or SRI or socially conscious or where does that balance out or how do you look at that in the portfolios that uh, that fall under high views uh, asset uh, management? So we, yeah, so th there was an aspect of ESG that I would say was always a part of our due diligence process, although admittedly it was a focus on the G, even at, at our level. Um, but I would say about five or six years ago, we made a more explicit effort to build ESG into our due diligence. Uh, process. And, um, and as a result, we then, you know, wanted to know more from each of our investment managers, uh, what they were doing on the ESG side. And so, you know, where, where we sit today with that is that every one of our managers is a signatory to the uh, principles for responsible investing uh, set out by the UN and, uh, and each of them integrates as, as a signatory. They, they all consider ESG as part of their due diligence when evaluating investment opportunities. And, and then, then, oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, just the one last piece, just a little over a year ago, uh, we uh, initiated the position in our first uh, impact uh, mandate. I, I'm not aware of that. Can you uh, cover a position of first impact for me? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a basically, you know, we, we thought it best to have a, a standalone balanced product so that we're not sort of adding to just equities or just the fixed income side or, or even the alternative side where this would have a little bit of everything. Um, it, it has public equities and it's got some private equity. Uh, uh, positions. It's got traditional fixed income and and some private lending, uh, and so it it is uh, that way. It's an easy thing to, even though it's a relatively small position, um, to kind of latch on to a portfolio because it's already a balanced uh, mix, and so uh, it sort of fits in nicely with an otherwise balanced portfolio. And the, and it has some screens built into it or some. Oh, it, it's it's a uh, it, it is impact specifically. It's okay. not just oh, ESG. Okay. So on the on the All public right. side, um, it, it'll be a blend of ESG and impact. But there are even on the public equity side, there are impact specific uh, uh, investments, and then all the private side is impact. So it it, it really oh, okay. is impact focused, and so that way it was taking the ESG uh, piece one step further by having this option, and it is an optional mandate for, for clients who, who really want to you know, direct their dollars in, that, in that, uh, that sort of mandate. Okay, perfect. We had uh, David O'Leary on in uh, season three. And yeah. so of course there's an opportunity there for people to catch up on what impact investing is. So yeah, that's- uh, Yeah, that's no, he's, uh, he's great. He's very knowledgeable in impact. Yeah, absolutely. And- Among, among other areas. It's true. Yeah, he's not, not a one trick pony, but uh, <laughs> no. yeah. Um, so the, um, just going back then to the foundation side, <clears throat> so how much of your research, I assume you do some like pure hardcore CFA type, like investment research. Do you, do you have research that looks at like how foundations behave or how 
charitable donations work. Is that something like, is there an ample body of research out there and do you access that kind of thing? Uh, that hasn't been a big focus of mine. No. Um, you know, I'm aware of some of the, some of the uh, discussions happening uh, around disbursement quotas and things like that, but uh, um, like behavior of, of foundations or that sort of thing, I, not something that I've spent uh, much time on, no. I wasn't sure how, uh, like how many tentacles your research would have exactly, so that's... Uh, if, um, only I could, uh, if only I could copy and paste myself. Although it's not everybody would be happy with that, but I'd get a lot more done. <laughs> That's a fair point, yeah. Um, so I want to uh, switch gears then a little bit and just chat about uh, fiduciary responsibility. So yeah. we're sort of in the midst of, I mean, as we speak, a lot of the um, investment world, obviously your shop, not a concern. You've been fiduciary for decades, but... Uh, a lot of the investment world is kind of grappling with the introduction of client-focused reforms. And I mean, it's just around the corner now from when the final batch of uh, CFR takes effect. Yes. Do you have comments for folks out there who are um, concerned? I know that CFR doesn't create a fiduciary standard, but I think it does get us a little closer there on the investment side. Do you have comments out there for folks who are concerned? And, you know, I re like just, Last week, I had a, a discussion with a former student on LinkedIn who said, well, I'm no longer in the business because of the uh, compliance requirements. Oh, so I, I, I found it interesting, too. And that's where I, I wanted to ask you about this, about, you know, if, if you're concerned about hefty compliance requirements, I, I assume the way your shop does things, like it's a, I'm sure at this point, a non-issue. Can you talk a little bit about what, how you view compliance and what a shop like yours does to make sure that you you stay on side? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm still kind of thinking about that former student. I'm wondering why they got in the business in the first place if, uh, if compliance uh, and, and sort of standards of care are driving them out. But uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we are a legal fiduciary. As, uh, as a firm registered in the category of portfolio manager, we've got discretion over client assets. And so that puts us in in that position of trust, uh, it puts us in that fiduciary uh, category, uh, something we, we embrace and, and promote to, uh, to some extent. Um, so in terms of compliance, um, yeah, we've got, and I, I would say we've attacked compliance the way we've kind of attacked everything else that, that, uh, that is done within the firm, which is, you know, wrap a fairly robust set of processes uh, around it, not just written uh, uh, procedural documents, uh, which of course every firm has to have around compliance, uh, but also around, around executing on those and, and a process for making sure that we're checking in and making sure that everything is, is getting done. And so, um, I mean, that, that's essentially, so we've got you know, recurring meetings to review all of that stuff to make sure that we've documented that, that it's all been done. Um, and, and that's kind of the oversight piece uh, to make sure that all of the, the tasky uh, stuff is, uh, is completed on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, depending on, on, on the task, so. And so that, that's good from that perspective. What about investment policy statement or some document in that vein? Is that a big part of your process? Huge, yeah. Because every client, unless they, unless they refuse or if there's clearly not a need, they, they get a wealth plan. Um, uh, but even before that, there is a, a formal proposal. So before uh, a client makes any commitment to us, they, they have a really good idea of what they're getting into. They know the cost, not just the headline fee that we are charging, but the actual total cost, which is not that common in our industry. No. Uh, it's quite often to say, oh yeah, uh, we charge uh, you know, 50 basis points, 100 basis points for you, for a portfolio of your size. Well, there's HST, there, there's custodial costs, there's I mean, there's a handful of other cost buckets. And so um, at the proposal stage before 
uh, before a commitment is made, clients have a very, very clear idea of what this is going to cost them. Uh, Can I so just jump in? I assume when you disclose that, you're doing that both as like basis points and dollars then? Would that be accurate or? Uh, I think just basis points on the proposal stage, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah I, and I'm not aware of any, anyone else that even does that. No, that that requires a lot of work just to figure out all the costs that that actually like when you take everything into account that's uh, that's not yeah. a, not a small <laughs> amount of effort so. so yeah so again we we have invested uh both time and money to create the systems to make sure that we've got all of these things documented you know uh, for compliance for us internally, but also for the client. So they have uh, the proposal in writing, they've got their wealth plan, and they've got an investment policy statement. And any, any updated, uh, any updates to, to those documents as required. And, and we've got, you know, I, I think, again, very biased, but uh, 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 quite robust uh, reporting as well on a, on a quarterly basis that, uh, that we're, we're always just working to, to improve. How can we make this better and clearer and more meaningful for the client? What about uh, technology in terms of your client interactions? Is this uh, pretty hands-on or do you have a fair bit of help from technology tools? Uh, it's, it's a hybrid, it's both. Yeah, we, we make heavy use of technology, but it's a pretty hands-on uh, engagement. So, yeah, I mean, I would assume your clients demand a fair bit of hands-on, right? In this, uh, I, this I think market. I think the way that we the way that we do things requires hands-on, and I think the clients that that want that will naturally gravitate to us. But I, I think you know, as as you as you go up the wealth scale, uh, I think there's there's a natural inclination to want and need uh, higher touch, so to speak you know, more interaction. Right. And you talked about your role. You saw yourself as more of a risk manager than a, like a return generator. I think that, that, that's where risk, that does. Risk manager and, and portfolio architect would be, there would be. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that requires, like, then you have to be paying a lot of attention to risks within a portfolio. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm, I'm loath to ask this, ask this question, but I'm going to ask anyways, and we'll see where this takes us. So we are recording this uh, just middle of September here. The election was yesterday. Yeah. And tons of talk about a bubble, right? It, whether like overvalued or, and actually there's the news about, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not going to get the name right, but this real estate developer out of China that's got now some structural problems apparently that are going to domino through. Do you do you care about a bubble? Is it like how does that influence your your thinking about portfolio design? Definitely care about bubbles. <laughs> right. I would say that I, um, I think I'm less concerned about bubbles per se than just always trying to be very risk aware. And so bubbles referring to potentially excessive you know, risk from excessive valuations uh, is, is something you know we're, we're very attuned to. Um, but I, I think we want to be careful not to be not to get obsessed with trying to find the next bubble um, in terms of the, the label, the, the next thing that's really going to break the back of the global economy and, and just cause like a, a, a true global meltdown. Um, and, and I think the reason is it, it's awfully difficult to try to do that. Um, you know, there have been probably a couple of people who have been like globally, relatively few that have been pretty good at calling those things. Um, but I'm not... I, I don't know that that's a reliable way to manage portfolios uh, because they, they pop up relatively infrequently and they're just notoriously difficult to see in real time. Yeah, I mean, many of the signals you see people point to today have been 
relatively consistently problematic for a couple of years now. I, that, that's what strikes me as problematic about trying to call the bubble, right? Is you, you start sitting out two years ago and miss, you know, two great years in the market. Like, well, that, yeah, that's, I think, yeah, you know, there's a couple of things. Like I, I can even remember, uh, I age myself a bit, but early in my career when, when Alan Greenspan first talked about irrational exuberance back in 96 and, and you still had another four years to run uh, in the equity markets before you really hit uh, uh, the next bear market. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's. It, I, I think if you if you if you really knew something big was happening in two years, uh, a couple years worth of gains is an easy thing to give up. I think the problem is things can run much longer than you think they will. The problem is that you don't know how much longer before something unravels, whether it's a bubble or just natural part of the cycle, because we will have a bear market again. Um, you know, maybe we won't have to wait another 10 years to get it uh, like we did last year's, but uh, uh, you know, on average, historically, we get one about every eight or nine years. Now, sometimes they are clustered together. That's a very, very long-term average. You know, we had 08 and then we had 2020, but before 08, we had 2000, so you had two within eight years. Uh, and not long after the, the 2000 had, had recovered. So, you know, sometimes they are clustered and sometimes they're spaced apart and trying to really guess, you know, what the triggers are going to be and when the next one's going to be. It really is a bit of a time decision because you can be right, but if, if it's eight years before the next bear market, well, then it's not worth trying to sit out and hedge for that. Um, if it's a year or two out, then it is. So it really is a bit of a time, time becomes a, a pretty key factor. And so our philosophy around that is, is again, to manage the risk. We know that there will be bear markets. We know that bubbles will pop up from time to time, but the way that we manage that is by uh, trying to match clients' investment assets as best we can with the spending liabilities that that we have worked with them to, to flesh out and quantify. And so any short-term or even medium-term goals they, they have, we've got assets dedicated to that that will fund those. Longer-term uh, spending goals, we can afford to take uh, some risk, but even then it's diversified. Um, it's not just based on investing in US equities, for example, or just Canadian equities. Uh, it is a diversified basket of global stocks of, of all sizes. Um, and we've got fixed income. And then we've got, you know, assets outside of those two markets. And so uh, that's the idea is to try to build a portfolio to hit uh, specific return targets that the clients need, but do it in a way that it comes from a variety of, of risk factor uh, exposures. That makes sense. And... Um, as I understand, you do, and maybe just because this is what I read in your uh, media stuff, but you use a fair bit of exchange traded funds, Dan. Am I misplacing that? Uh, I, I probably get asked and talk about it more than we actually use it. Okay. I mean, the, the whole idea with ETFs, I, I, the thing that I, I don't like about the media exposure about ETFs is that it's too much about one structure versus another when when you know the structures themselves are, are highly similar it's just about you, you want a certain investment exposure uh, once that decision is made just go find it at, at the cost that makes sense and in a structure that makes sense and etfs and mutual funds are basically the same structure that just trade differently because of of, uh, of, of those mechanical issues but otherwise it's essentially the same same vehicle yeah I, I'm curious how that came about. I, I'm hoping here we can chat about your, your media presence a little bit because you are kind of one of the go-tos in Canada when it seems like a journalist has a question about ETFs. Yeah. So can you chat a little bit about how you, how you ended up uh, being like that go-to resource? Do you, do, you have, do you know how this happened? Was it an accident? Was it oh, uh, no, by design? I didn't. <laughs> No, it was a definite, uh, there, there was a definite moment where that, that started. Um, it, it goes back uh, to the late 90s. 
uh, when I, I, I started as a client-facing financial advisor uh, at what would today be considered an MFDA firm. MFDA didn't exist back then. Uh, aging myself again, <clears throat> right. but yeah. uh, uh, I spent a few years in that role, and um, you know, I was I always had an inclination toward research. Uh, in fact, one of the I think the my uh, first uh, I guess branch manager I worked for would complain that that I was reading too much, not seeing enough clients. <laughs> but I guess that was that was a that was a sign of things to come. But, um, but I was an avid reader of, of uh, uh, lots of things, but in particular articles by, uh, by Duff Young. So I know a lot of, a lot of current uh, uh, advisors perhaps won't, won't know because he, he stopped writing in the Globe uh, about 20 years ago, but, um, but he was the go-to uh, person when it came to investment fund. Uh, research and you know if you think back to the 90s it was the boom times for the mutual fund industry anyway he'd, he'd started a company uh he's also from uh from windsor i'm this is where you're speaking me uh, speaking to me from and uh and we were introduced a few years prior anyway he he kind of gave me my start on the research side and he'd already had uh, a big media presence as a columnist and and a go-to uh, from other other media sources, and so it was really it was really from from working side by side with him that uh, that that started, where he just started passing the calls over to me, and then the calls started coming straight to me, and then when I left there, the the calls followed. And they have they have since. So uh, that was really the start. I mean, it, it was it was literally kind of given to me. The door was open. It was up to me to go in and, and, and do something with that. But I never, never made any real proactive effort to be in the media because it was kind of uh, initially at least handed to me. And then I just, I just took it from there. Okay. I guess uh, strike while it's there, right? That's yeah. Yeah. Makes, yeah. Makes sense. Um, and you still, do you produce content, uh, Dan? I'm just, I'm not, are you still yeah. like, yeah, right you know, not, public not, consumption? not so much these days. I'm finding it hard to, uh, to write. So I started writing. I mean, I've been writing since day one. I was writing client newsletters when I was an advisor. I was doing a lot of internal uh, research writing when I worked with, with Def. Um, but in 2000, I started writing articles on sort of the public uh, domain on the, on the Internet. And for probably four and a half years, I wrote like a thousand words every single week on top of other stuff I was doing internally okay. because yeah. it was, it's that buildup, right? Of all these things. And believe me, the four and a half years worth, uh, I'm sure half of them uh, I would wince at today if I went back and read them. But, um, but you know, it, it was something I had to get out. It was just stuff that, that had built up and there was an outlet for it. And, and so, um, you know, but things started to slow down a little bit after that. Um, but it sort of came and went. My, you know, my goal has been to try to write a blog post uh, one a month. And that has proven challenging in part because of my <laughs> workload, but also because I'm not one. Uh, I don't like to write just to write. And I don't but like you to said repeat. You had stuff to get off your chest when you were doing that back in 2000-ish, right? So. Well, yeah, I think, think of, you know, by that time, it's sort of, six or so years uh, of working in the industry and, and all these thoughts and things that I wanted to get down. And yeah, I just, so there, so there was a, a, a buildup of a lot of years of, of stuff and, you know, you're, you're still in that learning. I mean, never out of the learning stage, but especially back then early days, just learning so much. And so uh, I was sort of writing through those various, various phases. So there was a lot, and there was a lot that was changing. That was, you know, ETFs were just starting to, to grow in Canada. Um, so many new products. So anyway, there, there, was, there was just a lot going on. And, and these days, you know, I don't, I don't like to just write the same things that I wrote before, unless there's something really new, uh, some new angle. So I, I'm certainly finding it harder, but I'm still, still aiming to get back to that, that once a month. So no, the reason you didn't you don't see much content being produced for me these days is because I just I haven't. 
I haven't done much again, other than um, other than what I do internally for for our firm. But uh, but I'll get back to it. I hope soon. <laughs> nice. I've got a list. I've got to I oh, keep a list of ideas. Otherwise, I'm going to forget them. I like that. That's good. I look forward to that. So I'm um, just going to the research side then. You know, it sounds like you were a voracious consumer of research right from early days. Do you, um, is it all academic journals? Do you, do you read people's books? Like, which, I don't know, like, uh, uh, I assume there's some of the classics you'll uh, like uh, against the gods or whatever, but I assume that is it mostly journals or how do you how do you look at consuming it, content it's a bit of everything um and i've actually found twitter is great is a great resource for this because i i will uh frankly some of what i read are just twitter threads from people who appear to be very very sharp on a particular topic just anything that interests me but um but no it, it's it's academic journals it's um, just online articles it's books uh you know, I try, you know, if I, if I throw out a name, Michael Mabusin, for example, is someone that I just, I love the way he thinks about issues and the way that he expresses it. So I really try to read uh, just about everything, although he produces quite a bit of content. So that in itself is a challenge even to keep up with everything. And I'm waiting for, uh, for another book of his. I read, uh, I think it's called The Success Equation, which was excellent. So so it is a combination. It's books, it's journal articles, other online articles, and just things that that can be sourced through through Twitter. And I try to try to cultivate my uh, follow list uh, accordingly, uh, so that I, I don't get too much of the the junk because it is something I use strictly for work. It's not a personal uh, personal thing. Yeah, I uh, I mean I agree with you. There's so I think like Brian Portnoy, Brian Portnoy, sorry, and uh, yeah. Dan Crosby are two people that. And I, I always seek out yeah. their their Twitter because they do good threads, right? Both of them are yes. thinkers yeah, that are worth, uh, yeah, worth following. I have to get, because I don't have a lot of pure asset management folks on, on Twitter. So maybe uh, I'll look at uh, who you're following and see if I should <laughs> put somebody up there. So, um, now, the... Uh, have you have you seen this? Um, and I don't know if you can comment on this. You you used to be in an MFDA shop, so. Um, but uh, what about folks who are responding to going back to this uh, concept of too much uh, too much compliance? So I'm out. You know, a sort of stopgap I see around that sometimes is where people will drop their investment licenses and go to an insurance only, where they'll do seg funds for all their or seg funds and then a maybe uh, use a discretionary shop for their asset management. Have you seen this, Dan? Do you know what I'm talking about here? I mean, I, anecdotally, I've heard about this for years and years, um, long before the client-focused reforms, uh, long before even the registration reform back in 2009. Um, so yeah, I, I've heard about it for a long time. Uh, it's a way to escape the, the heavier compliance requirements of the the securities industry to sort of uh, use a more of a blanket term. And, um, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to your one of your earlier questions, which I'm not sure I, I really answered uh, fully, which was, you know, this whole idea of, of you know, the best interest uh, standard that's built into the CFRs and, and really, you know, how you look at that. Um, and so I'll kind of answer this question with finishing the answer to that other question, which is uh, like, I'm, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not, uh, but, but here's the way I kind of think about, uh, I think one, one important way to think about the, the best interest standard or even a fiduciary standard, which, which we have. And that is, you know, if, if we can just think about if I was sitting in the client's chair, how would I want to be treated by the, the financial advice industry by the firm that I've engaged? What are the things that, how would I want them to communicate with me? What are the things I would want them to show me without having to, to you know, pull teeth and try to ask and dig? Um, and I think if we think of those things, of, of the things that we would want, and just figure out a way to build your business around delivering those things to people, I, I think a lot of the problems we have in our industry would, would not exist. Um, and so I, I think about that in, in your question, 
with dropping uh, investment licenses because those are, are being done not because it's the best thing for the client. It's being done because it's the easiest way to continue to generate revenue with the least amount of friction. And, you know, again, it just, it goes against that whole notion of, well, what's best for the client? If you were that person's client, would you think you're better off because now you're being sold, you know, this segment of products because it's it's not as heavily regulated or doesn't require a, as much disclosure or or is maybe maybe being sold with a lower level of uh, standard of care uh, wouldn't instill a lot of confidence in me if i knew those things but um, but that's what i come back to uh, and, and that's what i think of of um of, of that notion of, of dropping the investment license to focus on insurance. If you're focusing on insurance because you are want to be and are an expert in insurance, I think there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing it as a way to sell investment products without the heavy regulation of the the securities industry, I think then I, I sort of fall back on what I just explained about, you know, it does certainly does not strike me as being in the client's interest. It's more in the individual's uh, advisor's interest. That makes sense. Now, I actually want to circle back to a different topic here, speaking of answering earlier questions. Um, so do you have comments, tips, advice for uh, people right now who are thinking about adding some sort of content creation to their business model where, you know, like you, they've maybe built up a bunch of stuff they want to write about or they want to talk about or whatever it happens to be? Um, Anything that you would say based on your experiences here or just what you see people uh, willing to put pen to paper around? Uh, I don't know if I'm the best to answer that, but I'll give you the best answer that I, that I can. Well, I, I think you're a success story in this regard. So I think you're, <laughs> whether you're the best answer or not, your advice is worth something. So. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Again, like in, I'll just speak from my experience. The things that I've written about are just things that 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 I have a lot of interest in, and that I think are relevant for uh, for investors. Um, and I think if I just try to write about what I think will get att attention, uh, I, I'm not sure I would. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't enjoy the process of creating the content, and I'm I'm not sure how well it would be written because it would feel like a chore. <laughs> so it probably take me a long time to, to get it completed. Um, so I, I mean, I think to the extent that, that, that I've had success uh, in terms of creating content and getting, um, building somewhat of an audience for, for my articles, it's been more a function of, you know, writing about things that I, I care about, writing about things that I have strong opinions on. So I, you know, People are going to have different ideas around content creation, especially as part of a marketing strategy. I never did it as a marketing strategy. I just did it because I wanted to write. I was, I've was i always been interested in writing. As I mentioned, I was writing you know, silly little newsletters uh, to clients. I mean, now I think they're silly. At the time, you know, I thought they were, they were pretty good, but, um, but it was really out of a desire to write and write about things that... that uh, that I thought it was knowledgeable about and, and that mattered to me. And, and that's really what I went with. It, it was never uh, about a, a strategy of building an audience or getting any attention uh, for it. So, so you really, you wrote for you, you created content for you. And I mean, that's valuable because then clearly it does uh, echo your passion. And I think that that's always useful. So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, just as, as an example, like I, I've written a lot about uh, these these monthly income funds that that pay out excessive amounts of, of cash every every month, and that that arose again not out of any overall strategy, other than I started to see really misleading marketing coming out about some of these products, and that that really lit a fire inside of me. I just thought it's wrong. It's just, it's misleading. And so I started digging into the products and, and found that they were just giving people their money back. And so that 
I've written about that topic probably more than anything else. And that's probably one of the things that I've gotten the most feedback on. Uh, not always um, positive, but I was just going to ask, what's the balance of good and bad feedback on the list? Uh, well, initially, when I wrote my first set of articles on on the monthly income funds, it was it was all negative. Okay, because at was the it, time the the product was was just sailing. Yeah, it was. I doing, remember. I mean, I yeah, I came into this business in two thousand and six, and certainly saw a lot of people pushing the. And at the time, if I remember right, they were largely sort of doing. 8% distributions. That was the, so yeah, I remember seeing people where they'd say, yeah, you can get an 8% return here. And yeah, I, yeah, so I mean, you must it, get, go ahead, I, I, yeah. I did, yeah, I, I did back then. So the first articles I wrote were just about 20 years ago it was uh, two articles in December of 2001. Okay. And, uh, and it was about what was then the Clarington uh, monthly income fund or Canadian income fund, whatever it was called. And um, uh, no, I got, I got a, a lot of heat from that. And sometimes I didn't even know when I was getting it, I would hear from, I worked for a dealer at the time. And so I heard from advisors that say, oh, the wholesaler was just in here and they were trashing. And the wholesaler would visit our branch where I worked. And, I, and they would, you know, the, the others would mention, oh, he just wrote an article on, on your fund, uh, gave him the synopsis of it. And, and the wholesaler said to me, Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> okay, whatever. I got registered Sex. letters. I got all kinds of uh, uh, of hate from that. Really? But, uh, fortunately, there I, was no social media. I'm sure I would have been trashed a whole lot more. But I was proven <laughs> proven right within. Fortunately, yeah. the bear market that that took hold in in uh kind of accelerated what I knew would eventually happen anyway. I mean, it was a balanced fund paying out a 10% annualized distribution. So. It really wasn't yeah. rocket science to figure out that wasn't going to last. No, but those funds are still around. And the funds are still around. The, the NAVs are a fraction of what they used to be. And the distributions are a fraction of what they used to be. So, right. Uh, yeah, which is why, that. you know, new products came out. I kept getting, getting lured into writing more about this stuff because I kept <laughs> seeing, you know, I had people then sending me emails say, hey, have you looked at this product? I'm like, no, I didn't even know about that. That's ridiculous. So I wrote about that one too, and the next one, and the next one. So it was well, really the same, to... the same theme, and it was yeah. just like new products that are coming up, whether I noticed them or other people brought them to my attention, and I just kept because uh, because some of these were were big and, and sold through through big distribution channels. So uh, so that's often what gets my attention because that means it affects a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I have to ask that, is there something, you said you've got your list going in the background here. Is there is something on the list you can talk about that uh, fills a similar role for you? Um, oh, I don't know if there's anything that 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 uh, gets me as fired up as that on my current list. Um, okay. But something I've been wanting to to tackle for a long time. Uh, I'm almost, I almost hesitate to talk about it because I think I, I was on Ellen Roseman's podcast like over a year ago. And I said, yeah, I'm going to write about this. She's like, oh, okay. let me know. I'm, I'm eager to see that. Well, I haven't written it yet. But okay. it, it really is this idea of, of um, uh, trying to find a good financial advisor, frankly. Uh, I've been on, on, on Preet Banerjee's podcast where, where we talked about that and we both kind of throw our hands up because it's a difficult thing to do in terms of giving people advice or a checklist and say, well, do these things and you'll find a great financial advisor. It's a really tough thing to do. It's a, it's a tough framework to lay out because I, I don't think the usual, um, the old advice of, you know, ask these 10 questions, ask for referrals. I don't think that really works that well at the end of the day. It can, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it works well enough. And so I'm trying to, I've got, I do have the framework of, of an article done, which I didn't have when I talked to Ellen a year ago, Okay, but, um, but it is something I, I, I'm trying to, to get done soon. So we'll see. Makes sense. I mean, I just, uh, Jason Brer just had John DeGuy on his podcast. And they covered that same question and, you know, it's like, there's, I just don't think there's a magic bullet question to to get you there it's 
Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, and my goal basically is to ha to give people some questions to ask that that we haven't really seen before in in the typical articles on on this topic. That's which is why it's taken me so long. But I, I do have the ideas on paper. I've just got to build them out a little bit. I look forward to seeing that. Um, okay. Um, any last minute thoughts for us, Dan? You've been great. Lots of good wisdom, and uh, just nice to hear your experience and and background. Uh, anything? Finally, you'd like to share that you think the advisory community would benefit from? Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think the advisory community is tired of hearing from me because uh, of, of some of my advocacy type type views. But um, but I, I would just reinforce that idea of I mean, it was the original idea I had when I started in the business, which was, uh, and I think I heard it from someone else, and it just resonated instantly with me. Which was, if you take care of your clients you know, the business will take care of itself. And it's similar to the the idea that I spoke about uh, earlier, which is, you know, just just it's really a basic idea of, you know, treat your clients and deal with them in a way that that you would want to be treated. And I know sometimes things are out of advisors controls because of what their firms uh, allow or require. Um, but you still have a lot of uh, a lot of things in your control. And I think if you do that, you'll be uh, and obviously find a way to, to do it in a way that makes business sense. I think that's the key and you'll be successful. Uh, but, you know, it, it's not, it's not the kind of advice that everybody's going to embrace. It's not going to resonate with everyone because there are some that are just going to be more sales oriented. So, yeah, I mean, I think our listeners, I, I maybe, I don't know, but I think my listeners are, they're education oriented. And I think that's going to go hand in hand with just what you're talking about. The, those, I think two things are, are closely intertwined. Well, and I guess the last thing I, I would mention is that being someone who is more research oriented, um, you know, I enjoy speaking with clients. I've done a lot of that, but it's not uh, the thing I love to do day in, day out. And so I think just from a broader business perspective, um, just recognizing the things that you that you love to do and that you're good at, and maybe finding whether it's one person or a team of people finding other people that have those offsetting skills that maybe love to do the marketing and the prospecting which i always hated doing by the way and i was never good at it because i hated doing it um, but i think that's sort of more general business advice but um but it's something i you know took me a while but i i uh, i found uh, my people who you know, my group my team that uh that you know, complement me perfectly, but uh, also uh, align so well just in terms of general values, but also business values. Yeah. So I, I, I think to the, and it may take time, but I think that that's uh, key just from a bit general business perspective. I, I see a lot of people struggle with that. I get uh, a lot of questions from students who are sort of midway through or completing their programs and yeah. you know, come back and say, uh, I don't know if I'm in the right fit for me or, you know, what else is out there. And uh, I think sometimes people aren't aware of the breadth of business models, for example. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Find you find a place where you're a good fit and, and a lot of other stuff will take care of itself. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Dan. You've been again, very generous and I know people will find this valuable. So thank you kindly and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. So you can see in there, Dan was maybe a little bit taken aback by my comment about um, folks who dump their investment licenses and switch to an insurance only model or people who leave the business altogether because of compliance. And I hear both of these things um, quite a bit. It's usually from, um, let's say, more veteran agents that they leave the business because of compliance. Uh, but quite often, even I hear younger folks, and in fact, I have a few friends who have uh, done exactly that, who have dropped investment licenses and gone to insurance only. And I think that this leads to a couple different conversations. My first comment around this is that I do find sometimes um, compliance departments, and I have a particular um, I don't know what it is, back and forth, I guess, is the best way to put it, with a, a compliance department at a national level firm right now about something where they are applying something 
in terms of uh, outside business activities that I don't believe is correct and I don't believe is supported by what we actually see. So sometimes you'll get compliance departments that do come down a little bit harder than what the rules as written would indicate. Now, this gets a little bit murky because I have certainly heard people say that sometimes the rules get applied in ways beyond how they are strictly written. But in the end, if you ever find yourself subject to any kind of disciplinary proceeding, the only thing that we can really rely on here is the rules as written. So if you feel like your compliance department is cracking down to a greater extent than what the rules say, the first thing that I would ask here is, hey, what's the basis for the, uh, the application of the rules you're taking with me here? What's the written set of rules that you're looking to follow or that you're concerned that I might not be following? And I think sometimes we're hesitant to do that. I, I think sometimes we figure that the compliance department is the be all and end all when really uh, we have a fairly robust set of written rules, whether you're MFDA or IROC or insurance, whatever it happens to be, we have a fairly robust set of written rules that we should be able to look to for guidance to say, hey, here's what the rule actually says my obligations are or my requirements are. And how does that differ from what you perceive that I'm doing with clients? And it's not that I think we should necessarily be in a constant back and forth with our compliance departments, but I do think um, compliance departments have a very tough job. And I think sometimes it can be helpful if there's a little bit of, hey, look, I get that you're trying to help out. I get that you're trying to keep me out of trouble. And ultimately that's what compliance departments, compliance departments are trying to do. They're trying to keep their advisors out of trouble and the firms out of trouble. So let's recognize that when we're working with them. And then really from there to be able to go back and say, hey, look, this is what I am doing. And I think another thing that happens here sometimes is we sort of hide this from compliance departments where we say, well, if I tell compliance, then they're gonna have a problem with it. And that might be a bad sign in and of itself. So let's not take the approach that we're supposed to hide things from our compliance departments. Um, but I think that if we take the approach that, hey, this is how I'd like to run my business and what can I talk to my compliance department about to make this possible? And actually I'm excited here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have, I'm going to be interviewing a, a former chief compliance officer, uh, somebody who has a, a lot of insight into this. And I look forward to talking some of these questions over with him. And I think that uh, it's one of those things where um, if you have questions, if you have stuff you'd like me to go over, there is time to reach out. So fire me an email at uh, jason.watt at businesscareercollege.com and we can talk about that. I have a good round of interviews upcoming here. The next session after this will be with a lawyer where we're probably going to be talking about family law. I hope you'll join us for that one as well. The number for today's episode is seven. Again, I hope you'll join us in a couple of weeks. Enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five-question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, Within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner. And from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Rennie Wong, and Sushami Pamela Paquette are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training 
which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals. <laughs>